stay tuned for the Joan Quinn Profiles. Joan served the state of California as a member on the Arts Council and on the Film Commission. She was formerly on the Architectural Commission and fulfilled two terms on the Fine Arts Commission for the city of Beverly Hills. As an editor for Andy Warhol's Interview Magazine, Condé Nast Publications, and the Hearst Corporation, Joan covered the world of fashion, the mysteries of food, the excitement of theater, and the international art scene. She continues to find people who are on the cutting edge of their professions. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. We're taping here at the Hollywood Museum in the historic Max Factor building and our guests are author Edward R. Bosley and artist George Legrady. Author, professor, director of the Gamble House, Edward R. Bosley, Ted to us, <laughs> was born and raised in San Francisco. He graduated with a Bachelor of Arts in Art History from UC Berkeley and earned his master's at UCLA. He teaches a summer program in heritage conservation and has co-written a monograph on the work of architects Green and Green and a book on the Gamble House, which we have here, Building Paradise in California. And he was uh, working at the Gamble House, and he was appointed director in 1992. Um, so we have to find out what <laughs> director is, because you have curators and all that, right, right. right. at each house. But um, when you got out of UCLA, was it your plan to work uh, with architects? Gosh. Um it, there's a funny story there. I uh, actually uh, didn't know what I wanted to do <laughs> for sure, but uh, my both of my parents had worked in the advertising business in mm. in the, the in, in the 1940s and 50s, slightly before Mad Men, and uh, I uh, was interested in doing some kind of arts management work because uh, I had this uh, combination of business and art history. Uh, but the, the job that I wanted, or I thought I wanted, uh, didn't materialize uh, right away. Not that I knew exactly what that was. Was it in Los Angeles? In, uh, in, this was in San Francisco. Oh, in San Francisco. Uh, but some friends of mine were going to New York to interview for <laughs> jobs in advertising. So I thought, well, I'll tag along and do that. And I got an, an offer at, a, at a, 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 a very nice agency in New York. Uh, but I took the job because it was in the Chrysler building, and I Which, wanted to go up in those beautiful elevators every day. Because the lobby's so beautiful, gorgeous, isn't it? <laughs> absolutely gorgeous. But were you interested in architecture at the time? Well, apparently, yes. I mean, oh, I, you uh, didn't realize. <laughs> I, uh, well, I, I actually did have uh, a, a lively interest in architecture history, but it was sort of a, like a hobby. Uh, I mean, I had grown up in San Francisco, lived in a Victorian house with all the creaky uh, doors. And, I know and they old creak, stuff, and it was wonderful. <laughs> And I loved that. And, and at Berkeley, I lived in a green and green house, a, a house designed by green and green, just a year after the Gamble House was designed. Oh, you did? Did you know green and green as architects? I had no idea who they were. So was it just like, oh, this is a craftsman house? Right. It was, well, this is a I, wood house. It was a, a big wooden house. It yeah. had something about it that was particularly compelling to ah. me. And I think it was that combination of of uh, the rustic craftsman look and this beautiful Asian elegance, the Japanese style permeating right. that design. And so I went up the door and I said, what is this place? Can I live here? And the guy said, well, this is uh, the Sigma Phi fraternity house. You mean when you were at Berkeley, when you I was did that? Berkeley, oh, you loved it? I just went, I loved <laughs> just the like, house. Just yeah. like the Chrysler <laughs> elevators, right? right? <laughs> so finally, you know, um, uh, I realized it was all about the architecture. Uh, After I'd been in advertising for a few years, I got a call from my predecessor at the Gamble House, the former director, Randall Mackinson, and he said, would you be interested in coming to work here? How did he know you? Well, uh, because I had lived in the Thorson House, I developed an interest in Green and Green, and I came down to Pasadena, where the Gamble House is, Right. and I knocked on that door, and I said, <laughs> uh, what is this place? <laughs> I'd like to learn more about the architect. Oh, that's very interesting. And so that was, that was your happened. introduction to that, the Gamble House? That's right. That or was, introduction to architecture, really? Uh, well, uh, pr pretty much. I mean, from an academic standpoint, yes. Because, I, because then you went on to like do this arts and crafts 
movement. I mean, where you're very involved in that. Is that part of this time when I, when frame? When I really started to reflect on what it was that was motivating my interest, I had to go back to age three. <laughs> <laughs> and the oh. and the church that we attended in San Francisco, which was this, the Swedenborgian church, which oh. is this rustic, very arts and crafts church built in 1895 that has since become very famous for, for that uh, uh, for the, the style, connection to right? that movement. Yes. Yes. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and then when I really began to think about it, uh, I, I realized that that, that was, that was the, the original motivating factor which drew oh. me to the Thorson house uh, to live in. So subliminally, to, yeah. subliminally you yeah. were in church with your family <laughs> right. and here you were absorbing all My the architecture. My little three-year-old bottom in the chairs, <laughs> you know, know, looking up at the rafters with the you know, these, uh, <laughs> tree trunks with the bark left on, seriously rustic. Yeah. So what style would you, well, we're talking rustic, but what style uh, would you say is Green and Green? Green and Green's work is uh, it comes out of that rustic tradition, but they uh, have polished it to within an inch of its life so that it's this beautiful, very sensuous, uh, touchable, uh, although we ask our visitors not to touch, this, <laughs> this very tactile material of, of wood, which was their preferred material, uh, hand-finished and just lovingly designed and crafted so that when you walk into a green and green house, you have the emotional response that I think the architects intended, which is to feel very much at home. Warm. Yeah. It's very warm because of the wood, I guess. Yes. So let's go back. You're living in New York. You're going in those beautiful elevators. <laughs> um, and there's so many buildings in New York that have those beautiful lobbies. Mm -hmm. Your friend calls you. And do you leave New York and come back? Uh, not right away. Oh. <laughs> I uh, actually took a, a little detour through San Francisco, my hometown, uh -huh. and uh, I, the phone call actually came after I had moved back to San Francisco oh, to work for another advertising agency. But you were still in advertising. I was still in advertising, and God knows I was no good at it. But I, uh, you know, I, I stuck it out, and I, but I was, I had my antenna up for the next thing that would be more compatible with my interests. What were you doing in advertising? Were you writing? Uh, at the end, I was. Uh, my father was a writer, um, and uh, that actually ends up being the next love of my life, is writing. That and goes, I, that really pushes us into yeah. our book, yeah. and several books. You said you've written how many books? Oh, gosh, I don't know, five-ish. Um. <laughs> uh, five-ish. So, we, so um, the, the first book was a, a monograph. What mm -hmm. a monograph? Uh, a monograph, you know, a single subject full length single subject book on the architects green and green which was published by published by Fiden Press in London in 2000 so yeah. that's uh, and did and did that go hand in hand with the show that you had done an exhibition uh, that was the next uh, that was another book okay. later on in 2008 uh, a book uh, that I edited with our curator Ann Malik called uh, A New and Native Beauty, The Art and Craft of Green and Green. That's what I was wanted to talk about uh -huh. because that went on exhibit, had an exhibit yes, with it. Yes, exactly. So it wasn't really a catalog, but it was a... It was a publication related to the exhibit, yeah. And, and what was in that exhibit? Oh my gosh, uh, we had uh, the benefit of the goodwill of 35 different lenders to this <gasps> oh. exhibition. People who own green and green objects all around the world. We, we borrowed several pieces from a collector in Paris. Um, is that right? Oh, yeah. In it Europe, was, they're collecting American well, green and green? Well, it's unusual, but there are a few green and green aficionados in, in, in Europe. Uh, and where did the green and green the brothers, the brothers, right, mm -hmm. um, start their work? Uh, they, they went to MIT, uh, which was in Boston in at the Boston. time, not Cambridge, uh, Were they in the from 1880s. There? They were originally from Cincinnati and then grew up uh, in St. Louis went to Boston for architectural training, and then came to Pasadena in 1893, uh, which was the year, of course, of the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago. Anybody who could went to the fair in Chicago. So the Greens stopped there on their way to, to oh, California. I see. I see. And they may have picked up some of the, uh, uh, the influence of the Japanese there, because there was a Japanese pavilion uh, that was built by Japanese craftsmen with materials from Japan shipped over. 
uh, and that might have been that might have sparked their interest a little bit in the Japanese. Connection. So we're talking about an exhibition that goes with this book. Mm -hmm. You have international lenders. Mm -hmm. what, how did those people get in, interested in way California architects by that time? Right, they yeah. were building here. Mm -hmm. So uh, Green and Green uh, were pretty much off the radar screen in the 1920s, <laughs> 30s, think, and yeah. 40s. I mean, nobody was writing about oh, them. It so was, it was, they were undiscovered until in the post-war years, in the 1950s, Elizabeth Gordon, who was the editor of House Beautiful magazine for many years, resurrected interest in, in, in Green and Green. And it slowly built. And then in the 1970s, they suddenly, they hit the, i uh, sorry, in the 80s, they hit the auction market. And so one piece of Green and Green furniture suddenly selling for six figures was an amazing thing. Oh, that was so, so it really got publicized by being in the auction. People were collecting it, people yes. knew it in the art world, yeah. in the yeah. architecture and then world. People like Barbara Streisand and Brad and, Pitt became interested in, in Green and Green and, and then see. they were off and running. So you had 35 lenders, you had furniture, you had accessories. We had um, lots of light fixtures oh, right. and metalwork and mm -hmm. irons. We had drawings. We had uh, uh. watercolors. We had uh, original drawings. We had uh, stained glass, light oh, uh, fantastic. With, uh, pot, uh, ceramic pots from gardens, everything designed by Green and Green. Fantastic. So that was at the Renwick, which is in D.C., yes. and also at the Huntington, which at was the Huntington. in their backyard. That's, the... that's right. It started at the <laughs> Huntington, and it was also at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Oh, it went to Boston, yeah. too. Uh, so, did they build commercial houses? Did they build anything commercial, or was it all residence? Almost nothing commercial. Charles Green did design the interior of the Packard showroom for Earl C. Anthony. Here? Here in Los Angeles. On Vine Street? Yeah, on, in 1911. Because that's such a beautiful yeah. building. I don't know who did it, the it's building. It's not the one here on Vine Street. It was one downtown Los Angeles oh. on Hope Street. Oh, I don't remember that. Yeah, but I the was... one on Vine was a beautiful, modern building, right? Yes, that was a little bit later. I see. Yeah, and a different architect. So that was as close to commercial work as they came? Uh, that was about it. There was one office block in Pasadena that they did in the 1890s, but they were really residential architects. Okay, what is the director? Oh, I don't want to run out of my time. What is the director? You have curators, right? Are they on site? Uh, well, uh, who's on site uh, in the so building? On, on site, um, uh, curator, um, operations manager, housekeeper. Uh, tour coordinator. Uh, my office is actually a few blocks away. And you're the director. You're the director of what, just this one house? Of just this one house, yes. <laughs> but are there other green and green yeah. houses involved? There are, there are no other green and green houses that are open to the public. Oh, I this see. Is, this is it. And it's the only green and green house that still has all of its original architect designed furniture. I see. That's I what see. really sets it apart. So the director doesn't have to be there. Well, I, I'm there. You're every in an day. office. Oh, you're there I'm, every day. I'm there every day for one reason or another. But uh, but it's it, you know we we keep it open to the public, and so I I don't have an office in the house. Be, uh, I used to. It was in one of the boys' bedrooms. Do you give lectures? I do that. I write. I um, raise money. I mean, my real job is oh. to raise money to make sure that we make keep our budget going. every year. I see. I see. Um, and you teach conservation. At SC, yes, but not just for green and green. Does that encompass a lot of other things? Well, one of the great things uh, USC <clears throat> um, uh, has uh, stewardship of the Gamble House, and one of the things we do is use this use this wonderful house as a case study for our heritage conservation program. Oh, I see. So, and that's what you teach. That's in the School of Architecture yes. at USC. And what kind of who comes to that those classes? So it's really interesting. We, uh, many of them are mid-career people who are oh, really? looking to go into something different. The profession of, of heritage conservation really hasn't been a profession until fairly recently. So uh, this is a, a relatively rare program. So it's a it's a real profession rather than just joining the historical society yeah. to save a house or something like that. This is hard work. This is it's, <laughs> and it's very technical too, uh, and and so students will maybe dip a toe in the water and see if they like it and find out that there's there's actually there are so many disciplines involved in doing a good job of stewarding a, a historic site that they sometimes run screaming from the room, but. But other people uh, see their potential to, to really make a difference and, and, and uh, uh, adhere to it. So who, who photographed all these? 
We had a wonderful photographer, Alex Vertikoff is his name, and he's, uh, he's based in New Mexico. And he specializes, believe it or not, in this style of architecture. And so he knows exactly how to do this. And I think he really out outdid himself on this project. And then tell us a little bit more about the book. The book is, uh, it's 200 pages, and it's about half of it, uh, new, uh, new, uh, new photography by Alex Vertikoff. Essays by our curator, Ann Malik, who, wrote, who writes about the Gamble family. Another essay about uh, the landscape by Ann Scheid, who's our, our archivist. And an essay by yours truly uh, on, on the architecture. Do any of your students help you? Did any of your students work as interns <laughs> or research people or uh, anything we, like that? We, we did have a student intern working on, uh, on a green and green survey that we're doing, uh, but it didn't contribute directly to this oh, it did. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad you came because it's um, very distinctive. The book really explains all about the architecture as well as Ted Bosley explaining it. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you, Joan. I really appreciate your And me. don't go away because we'll be right back with artist George LaGrady. <music> Hi, I'm Joan Quinn and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. We're taping here at the Hollywood Museum on Highland in the heart of Hollywood. And my guest is artist, photographer, new media pioneer, George LaGrady, who was born in Budapest and raised in Montreal, where he studied at Loyola College and then went on to Goddard College in Vermont and continued his education at San Francisco Art Institute, earning his Master of Fine Arts. His work has been exhibited all over the world, Paris, Hong Kong, Sydney, New York, Toronto, DC, uh, and is shown at the Culver City Gallery owned by Edward Cella. Edward has a great eye, a wonderful group of artists working for him um, who really know different aspects of art. So what, hi George. <laughs> hi Joan, it's great what, to be here. What did you pick up first, a paintbrush or a camera? Well, I was trained as a, as a classical musician. Oh, you saw so <laughs> and, and my father was a composer. Really? So um, oh. that was the early days. And so what did you play? What instrument? Keyboards. Keyboards. And what did your father compose? Where was uh, that? In Montreal and, and Hungary. And so, um, but you know, so it was time to move on and, and do something different. Well, did you ever perform on stage? I did. I used to... I used to um, in fact, I made a living as a rock and roll musician and a blues bar musician from the age of 16 to 20. You're kidding. So you mean with a classical background, that's where yeah, you went? Yeah, I had, to, I had to carve an identity. and so. Oh, so totally different in your family, Rock and roll was, right? was the uh, way to do it. Did you write any of that music? Uh, some of it, but it was a, lot of, a lot of it was... Uh, you know, the music of the times, the, the 60s. Oh, that you play? Yeah. You know, Hendrix and the Doors. And so, so did you have any of those people come to the bars? Any of those musicians? Well, we, we opened for the Who once. Oh, you and, did? And, you know, we played with the platters. And wow. You know, I was just a kid. I you know, know but 16, was it fun? You know, I was trying to be cool. You, you, know? were, you probably were really good, right? Yeah, you know, I was on a B3 Hammond and uh, just trying to be, you know, trying to be part of the scene. But... Uh, around the age of uh, 19, I came across a photographer, and um, and I thought, you know, th that seeing the world through a machine and the kind of images it created really captured my my attention. Was was he a mentor in a way, or was it just something that you liked? No, no, the work of yeah. someone that you liked. He was a uh, photographer in Montreal. Mm -hmm. His name was John Max, and he. Uh, was very visceral, bohemian, um, and um, very focused on how images work, and oh. so so that was quite a quite a uh, inspiring reference. So you picked up a camera then, yeah. I guess, not a paintbrush. No. I thought you painted too, in a way. No, I, I'd say photography is really. So all the images through photography. Yeah. All of your images are through photography. Um, why we. Why do we call you um, a pioneer then? Okay, so um, 
so <laughs> <laughs> because sure. this is cool too, right? Yeah, yeah. This is like you were yeah. trying to be cool with rock and roll, so yeah. you threw me for a minute, but you're trying to be cool with new digital imagery. So, so in 1981, I, um, I was introduced to a computer and I discovered something very powerful, which was the undo button. <laughs> you could do something on the computer and, and, and if, it, if it didn't work, you could, you could click the undo button and step back. Whereas imagine if you're in photography and you have photographic paper in the developer, you have to guess what moment to pull out the print. Right, right, uh, I so, see. So anyway, so I started, uh, I learned computer programming in 1981, and in, I had to wait till 1986 until digital imaging systems were uh, available. So that was, was what you decided to do, was to manipulate those photographs, is that it? Well, I, I realized that everything will go digital, and so the transition from from an image created through chemicals to an image that is made up of bits, digital bits, numbers, was, was going to happen. And so um, I was one of the early people who began to work with that in, in an artistic way. Were you still supporting yourself playing the piano? <laughs> no, at the time. No, I was a professor. I was, uh, I was going to ask you about yeah. that. Were you at SC at the yeah, time? Yeah, I was professor of photography at USC. Oh, so were you bringing this information into your photo classes? Yeah, actually, I, I received um, support from USC and, and from IBM and build up a system, you know, a digital imaging system. We, we call it new media, um, when does it become old? When, I mean, isn't it old media now? You're talking about the 80s. Yeah, so there's, you know, <laughs> there's all these different labels. There's uh, digital media, there's new media, there's, uh, I can't think of any of the other ones, but, but uh, I think new media came in response to digital media becoming old. Oh, is that? Is yeah, that, back uh, in the so 90s. <laughs> that, so it became old. Yeah. But now it's moving so fast. Now it, what do you say? Yeah, so everything, you know, now it's just, uh, I call myself an artist now. I introduced with, you as an artist because, yeah. but I thought that this work that we have on the set was manipulated with a brush. Okay, so. So tell us a process. Let's talk about this because it's yeah. so beautiful and it's so eerie. And if I were looking at it, I think you had some light on those people in the background and you had a black tree in front. So. Uh, <laughs> but that's not it, I know. So one of the things that interests me is, is the enigma of the photograph. It's, a, it's an image out of time. And, and the show that I'm doing at Edward Cella called Day and Night consists of Im family images from the 1940s that I'm pairing up with photographs of, of moonlights and landscape that I've taken today. Okay. So and so what you see here, it's very hard to photograph these images, and I can maybe show an earlier version. I produce these things called lenticulars. What are they called? They're called lenticulars. They're like, um, like the kind of things where you yeah. push them back and forth, they move. Right. This right. image moves, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so what I, do, what I do is I try to create s short narratives in, in the image itself, so you have a transition from one state to another and back and forth. So when the viewer looks at the image, they'll, they'll, see, they'll walk and see the transition from one to the other. So did, do you dig into the past? In, is this your own family? Yeah. So do yeah. you dig into the past and find old negatives or old photographs? or well, What you know, do you find? As, as, as people um, pass away, I inherit the... Uh, <laughs> The photo Whatever. boxes. Whatever's there in the garage. And, and I go through them and I, and I look for, for engaging images. This series comes from a, um, a weekend in Transylvania. Which oh, is, I wanted to ask you about that. Yeah, tell which us. Is, which is part of Romania today, but, but is, used to be part of Hungary. So and it started, Transylvania was in Hungary, then it became Romania. Romania. So even today, you, you know, if you go to... Transylvania, you'll find Germans and Romanian villages and Hungarian villages. So it was a series, Transylvania, and and you found these. Yeah, and it's yeah. An uncle of mine went there, and and what's engaging for me is is the photographs have 
people from different classes. You have the urban, oh. urban, you know, well-dressed, cosmopolitan yeah, people. Yeah, she has her beret on, and she looks really great in her and little in jacket. Photo, and then in the bottom, you have like a farmer. Yeah, yeah, like a Romanian peasant. Uh -huh. And and here we have people who are, who are kind of managing the the, the weekend place. It's like. Um, eerie right there's an eeriness about it and you don't see all of it until you start it's like a negative in yeah. some parts right yeah let me show this one it's uh so the some oh there's more of images yeah, that so you this don't is see a, this is a, a photograph of a hunt you see two wild boars at the bottom mm -hmm. and you see again you know a group of people These of different right here. different classes and for this image, I took the camera and I just moved it around the sky. So the white lines you see there, that's basically the moon, the full moon. Oh, wow. So this is a tr part of the Transylvania? Yeah, part of the Transylvania. And then you also, it, it worked into something called Frolic? Yes, so Frolic... Was this uh, part of the series? Yes, so at the, at the gallery you'll see there's a triptych. And Frolic consists of photographs of young kids and young women running around doing gymnastics and I thought you know what a normal activity but in these images they look so uh, unusual and 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 also stamped with a with a time you know of past being coming from the past so it was still part of that old uh, archive that you yeah, found 19, old photographs. do you go to thrift shops and find uh, photographs uh, I used to <laughs> did you? I yeah. used to, but I did a project called Posing Series where, where in 1986 where I went to the uh, San Diego swap meet and I collected photographs from the military. There oh. were a lot of, lot of uh, family albums from the Vietnam era. And did you use those? Yeah, I did, yeah. And that was shown here in Los Angeles at a gallery called Lace. Oh, yeah, I remember and, that. Yeah. And then um, National Gallery of Canada and other places. You've lived in Montreal and San Francisco and Germany. Mm -hmm. Did those places have influences on the way your work is? Definitely, definitely Montreal and and um, uh, California. Yeah. And uh, but so you you were born in Budapest and left at a very young age. Yeah, but you said you go back and forth. I, yeah, I do, I do because I do projects and there's a big digital media community, oh, and oh, so I do projects I and lecture and 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 do exhibitions. So tell me, um, were you influenced by any other photographers other than this first mentor that you met? Originally, definitely. Originally, Katia Bresson and uh -huh. Robert Frank and Winogrand and Friedlander and the oh, whole... Oh, you know all the... You, you yeah, work... you know, the, I, was, I was a hardcore uh, member of, of, you know, the fine art photography world and studied, studied photography. Did you ever <coughs> study the occult? Well, I'm a I'm very grounded person. I <laughs> <laughs> Is that the wrong question? Because so, it looks so, so much. It feels like you have the spirits of these people involved in your work. And I, well, I think, I think more, I would, say, I would shift the focus more towards the medium itself. The, the Instead of the, the uh, occult? Yeah, the, the photo, you know, if you look at a photograph, we, we believe the, the photograph, but it's such a, such a uh, uh, constructed and, and uh, mystical and maybe, uh, you, you know, we're not quite sure. We trust it, but if we really think about it, we know it's a fiction. It's a fiction, so you didn't study the occult. No, no. <laughs> more, it's more the medium itself creates the It's earth. more of what you can do with yeah, your camera yeah. and, and what's in your mind. Thank you so much. It was great. Thank I'm you so for having me. I'm so glad you were here, George. And thanks for being with the Joan Quinn Profiles today. And write to mm. me at J-A-Q-U-I-N-N-1 at AOL.com. Bye.